summer, Great Britain, the heart of England. For motor racing enthusiasts, all roads lead to one place, a very special setting for a very special event. The gold at the end of the rainbow. The British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Hot from his 17th Grand Prix victory, the Grand Prix of France, a superb win with distinction, Nigel Mansell, British champion, makes his first public appearance at this famous and now revised circuit to receive acclaim for his recent achievement and to attempt to add more laurels to an illustrious career. His is a formidable task to prepare, qualify and finally race for victory on his home ground. Nigel is at Silverstone with his entire family. You are to accompany him through the next three days. You are about to witness the man as he is, his duties, his obligations, the craft of his chosen profession. And we're just playing baseball because it's beautiful sunshine. Nothing will be left unexplored. This is a story in three parts, a very personal statement on one of the world's most thrilling sports. The first chapter has just begun. Tomorrow morning I, I'll probably get up at about 6.30 tomorrow because we have breakfast TV at 7, uh, 7.45 which is going to be on the, on the pit straight uh, for BBC Grandstand. That's going to be with uh, Bob Wilson I believe. And then literally, you'll see as the day goes on, I shall spend time and talk to you and, and let you know what's going to happen, perhaps just before it is going to. And then after some circumstances arise, which are just around the corner, you never know literally from one minute to the next what can surprise you. But in our game, after 11 years, uh, there will still be some surprises, I guarantee. Uh, it is Thursday evening, as I said, approaching sort of about quarter to ten now. And uh, I promise you this, uh, tomorrow we'll be able to talk to you and uh, let you know one of those surprises which I'm not aware of. I'm signing off. It's 10 to 10 now. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thanks. Day one, Friday, July the 12th. Nigel begins the morning with breakfast with his family. It's, uh, it's 7.35. I've been up since 6.35 trying to fix a generator. I mean, it's lovely uh, camping, holiday camping like this. But uh, we're just about to shoot off now to do BBC One breakfast television. And uh, I'll be back shortly. Good morning again from Silverstone, where the build-up to Sunday's British Grand Prix is getting ever more intense, and I'm joined now by Nigel Mansell. I'm trying hard to keep him <laughs> serious here at this moment, I can tell you. Nigel, on last week's oh, evidence yeah, yeah, a bit, bit higher, that, that, <laughs> uh, that brilliant uh, win in France, it, it would appear you've timed your form perfectly, or does it go like that? 50% the gate at Silverstone, you've got to get it together, Bob, haven't you? No, it was no, a great performance. Seriously, it was, it was fantastic, and it couldn't have come at a better time. And. Uh, it was just good. The team worked very hard. Renault worked hard, and uh, it just came together last week. You've always had this great relationship with the fans because it was here when you had retired, and before you actually uh, are reti no retired in the race, I meant. Uh, but you showed very much your relationship with the fans because you you've never really got in the political side, Nigel, have you? 
you've got this relationship. Now I have this fantastic relationship, quite correctly, uh, with, the, with the fans, not only in England but around the world too. And I must say that I'm proud of that. Mm. And uh, I feed off it and they feed off me. And I think that people forget in our business that it is a bit of a show business as well. We're there to sort of perform. I know it's a dangerous game. But I mean, people pay good money to come and see, you know, you drive and drive as well as you can. And uh, I don't think uh, it hurts anybody to give fans the courtesy of signing an autograph or being good to them. Mansell heads to his racing machine. The Williams FW14 chassis number five, which coincidentally is also his number in the race. An aerodynamic projectile, capable of rocketing its driver to well over 200 miles an hour. The potent V10 engine, a product of Renault, a Grand Prix winner in the great French tradition. Successor to names like Matra, Gordini, Delage and Bugatti. The gearbox is radical and innovative, a semi-automatic ship a source of great speculation by the world's press. The roll bars can be controlled by the driver. Seen from the inside, the whole of a Grand Prix weekend is a disciplined ritual, a rigid schedule of practice, qualifying, and finally, racing. The engine is now warmed up prior to Nigel's arrival. The use of telemetry is significant. Logging of data has allowed Renault to increase the power of their engine by 20%. Every nuance, water temperature, engine revs, oil pressure, is recorded. Mansell's vehicle is armed with a real flyer, a qualifying engine running on special fuel, a combination designed for limited use maximum effect. The carbon brakes are massive and strong, capable of sustaining searing heat. There are many unique features about the Williams. The gearbox is exceptionally heat sensitive. Silver foil is used to keep the temperature of this delicate device constant when not in use. Latest innovations on the FW14 are these homely but very necessary wheel nuts, which have just been redesigned having performed less than well at the French Grand Prix a week ago. The original nuts caused a slow tyre change in the midst of battle. Within hours after the race, the new parts were being fabricated, an example of Team Williams' attention to detail. But where is our driver? Good morning again. We're in the garage where the hard work starts. The fun's gone out the day already, although it's, it's going to happen in a bit. This is David Brown, who's been my race engineer for a good number of years. We've won about 14 races together. This is Stuart. This is Gary. And we've got Carl, who will come over here in a minute. And I, I don't want to say it wrong, because there's a lot of other guys in the team, but this is my number one car. This is the race car behind us. And these men here are responsible for literally everything. They're responsible in one word, and this is where it gets serious now, they're responsible for my life. Because if anything goes wrong, when anything drops off, then we have a problem. But I can say to you, looking at the camera, I've got more confidence in these four people here and the team than anyone else in the world, so I don't have a problem. Now, if you'd like to say a few words, David, to Heather, your wife, you can be a star. Here we are, starring in Source <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm serious. That was really good. He hates the camera. Come on, 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 very, very important this morning, especially with the weather and the forecast for the weekend, because we must get the cars going as quickly as we can, as soon as we can. We are qualifying this afternoon. We must be, if we can, be on the front two rows or on the front of the grid. And obviously here, very, very special for me, I'd like to be on pole position. So there'll be no hold bars. Uh, I mean, I'll be going as quick as I possibly know how. It's just a question of getting all the homework done. Day one, untimed practice. It's Nigel's custom to be first out on the course whenever possible. Good psychology for himself, emphatically a shrewd move on the opposition. Williams technical director Patrick Head defines the differences between Mansell and the Tracer. Nigel has a characteristic which maybe he uh, picked up in the ground effect days of a very high corner entry speed, um, which puts a lot of 
emphasis on turning on the car, so he generally will run one or two more holes front wing than Ricardo. Nigel then picks up the throttle and uses a sort of partial throttle in the corner until he can start applying full throttle towards the end. Ricardo enters much slower um, into the corner, breaks to a much lower speed on entry, but gets on much more throttle early in the corner. And, uh, so for him, there are small differences in balance, but just that's just a slightly different style. Homework done, 90 minutes of untimed practice concluded, Pit walkabout commences, and some few thousand of the faithful come close to their hero. The appeal of Nigel Mansell goes well beyond the fanatical enthusiasm of the racing fans. Nigel touches many persons outside the sport, both old and young. What is it the fans see? A caring, demonstrative superstar? A role model? Mansell's integrity and purpose. That very afternoon, Nigel would give them what everyone has come to see, a sample of his brilliance. Friday afternoon. The entire entry attempts to clip tenths of seconds from their best times. After a slight delay, Mansell appears and has a most lurid moment, a momentary loss of traction which puts the heart sideways in the British driver. In slow motion, the Williams suspension looks fully loaded. One may appreciate the tremendous speed of the Williams from Maggot's curve into Beckett's. In less than a second, Nigel's body is subjected to nine times the force of gravity. Then comes the blindingly quick reaction time, demonstrating Mansell's hand speed and the genius of Patrick Head's design team. Exit. Shower of sparks. Practice continues. Omens for Honda engine McLaren are dying. The daring Austrian ace Gerhard Berger blows up in a cloud of smoke. Oil on the track. Practice is suspended. Marshals place cement powder upon the patch and broom furiously. Minutes later, the all clear. Nigel flies round in a swirl of dust. Friday qualifying ends with Mansell making top time. Friday evening. And Nigel has a spot of bother with the BBC. We can, we can. I, can't, I can't do it for that. I mean, that's a joke. I'm sorry, I've got to say it as it is. I mean, from a driving aspect point of view, anybody who sees that, who's any kind of driver, knows that's a complete joke. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, that's absurd. Yeah. They've inexplicably yeah, lost the recording of his fastest lap. It is, right, I'm carrying cameras, I carry cameras this morning, I've got a yeah. camera on the car now. We've done three qualifying laps, we're sitting on pole, and you haven't got one of the qualifying laps to do. Mansell, who's a demon for authenticity, rejects the proposed material to the considerable discomfort of the editor and all concerned. I'll check with the guys to see if they are good. If you can bear with me a couple of minutes. Now, the difference on the car and how you drive it is just... The attitude, It's just marvellous different. Yeah, well that's G-Force. Yeah, yes, yes. That's the G-Force. That the A wild scramble through yesterday's footage yields results. Why don't you leave it in and say yeah, so? Yeah, well, we yeah. can. We can do, yeah. yeah. This is Nigel Mansell for the BBC. I'm just about to take you on a qualifying lap of the new Silverstone race circuit. Right, we're just going around the left-hander now, uh, through the complex and into the new woodcut, and then down the woodcut straight. Just coming around there now, and as you can see, a little bit of wheel spin and accelerating to the start and finish line. Getting Third, the sound fourth, on in yeah. Getting Mansell. Yeah. Get, get back and the minions yeah. cringe. Take, take the, the lion the growls. Yeah. This scene throws an insight into the demands made on Mansell in the service of the media. Oh, 
many hours of fun or pain working for Murray Walker. And his relationship with a certain well loved sports announcer. Where is it? For lunchtime? Yeah, 12 Okay, this is Nigel Mansell for the BBC. We're just about to start a qualifying lap at the new Silverstone circuit. Warming the tyres up now, going round the left hander towards uh, Luffield Corner and then uh, round here now to Woodcut. Day two, Saturday, July 13th. Good morning, everybody. It's Saturday morning, British Grand Prix. Somewhere about 8.40 in the morning. Uh, just finished breakfast. Nice bowl of crosses. That's not an advert for them, that was the only cereal we had in the cabin at the time. The great thing about waking up on Saturday is that you sort of look forward to trying to do it all over again. I guess uh, in Formula One you have two days of qualifying and two days of warm up. That commences at uh, 10 o'clock through to 11.30, which is on time, and then 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock where you're allowed two sets of qualifying tyres to go as quickly as you can. We have to do what is known as preparation for race today, and that really means that we have to fill the car up full of fuel, which is 215 litres to 220 litres of fuel. Really, for round figures, around about 50 gallons of fuel we put in the car, which makes the car very, very heavy indeed. And there's all sorts of subtle changes that we have to do in preparation for the race. Sometimes changing the uh, gear ratios and the gearbox to aerodynamics. So we have to do an enormous amount of preparation today and it's up to my good self and uh, the engineers of the Williams team and the mechanics to make sure we get as much as we can done. Very, very important indeed. This is our important day, our homework day for the race tomorrow. Among the many distinguished visitors to Nigel's pit is his boyhood hero Sterling Moss, whose record of 16 Grand Prix wins Nigel Mansell has surpassed. Morning practice, the full dress rehearsal for the crucial final qualifying session. Although times won't count for the grid, Mansell steals a psychological march on his rivals by stopping the clocks at an excellent 122.327, fastest lap of Silverstone yet seen. Mid-afternoon saw one of the most memorable qualifying sessions in recent Grand Prix history. Nigel completing a lap at 121.863, his attention is fixed on his computer as Senna goes out. The McLaren driver will have to show his hand. Senna does, bettering his Friday time to set 122.311. Good enough for second on the grid, but it lasted only five seconds before Ricardo Patrese started. With only two sets of soft qualifying tyres allowed and one set used, the contest for pole position is now a war of nerves. And Senna knows how to play this game. He waits ready for action. Nigel knows his rival will attack at the end of the final session, using all of his prodigious talent to seize pole position, leaving the competition no time to reply. Senna starts his last attempt to put his car onto the front road, front road the grid, and possibly by his standards onto pole position. Senna flashes his McLaren, practically bending it around the curves. With Senna out on the track, Mansell prepares, ready to make an instant response to the McLaren assault. to be 121.618, and that's pole for Ayrton Senna. And the only person really likely to be able to challenge that is Nigel Mansell, who knows what's happened. He's seen it on his printout. There he is, engines running. The Williams Renault and its driver make total effort. The new Silverstone circuit is being driven by a master driver. Smoothly. Perfectly. Blindingly quick. A magnificent 120.939.
Ayrton Senna can make no reply. Pole position falls to the rightful owner. I just got out of the car, as you can see, and uh, that was a special lap. That was a special lap. start the British Grand Prix tomorrow morning from uh, pole position. So really uh, the placings, although time factors are still carrying on, I don't think we can be bumped. In fact, uh, doing that lap, I know that we can't be bumped now. Uh, really happy. We've now got to set the car up. That means we have to alter an awful lot of things and uh, I will take you through the garage this evening showing you exactly the kinds of things that we have to do in preparation for the race. These are very happy. Nigel Mansell signing off at the end of the final qualifying session. Thank you. Nigel leaves the pits, heading for one of the Team Williams sponsor's hospitality marquees. It's one of the many personal visits he'll make during race weekend. Mansell is a tireless worker for his sponsors. Goodwill flows. After a day which would flatten a dozen men, he takes an opportunity to sit down, but not at 200 miles an hour either. He and his teammate Ricardo Patrese are presented with tasteful gifts. Hi, good evening. It's just gone 5.10 in the evening, and uh, as you can see, all the boys have uh, already pulled the car apart and they're putting it back together now. We've got a new engine in already, which is being fitted up by Renault. You can see various software left and right and uh, really it's an electrician's nightmare. You've got to get it right. Coming along to the front now, the disc brakes here are all totally brand new. Just like Ferrari, the only two cars in the pit lane, we give the input driving the car by flicking this lever. All we do is that, and to come down that. We have some connections there, which is all electrical and electronic. All we do is move the lever. Now, after we move that lever, we don't have any control over the gearbox. The driver has no control. That's all we do. We input the signal, and then the signal comes through to this magic box here, and then this magic box, via the various wires comes through to the back end and this is the rack to the gearbox and this is hydraulically operated and electrically operated I might add and it changes gear for us so that is all we do simple isn't it? I wish it was the most important person in the pit uh, tonight as well is Leo Hello Leo, my good luck charm, my eldest son, who's very tired at the moment, aren't you? Well, he ain't been playing baseball and football and, and everything else. These are all the nose cones for the race tomorrow. They're all going to be checked, they're all going to be set exactly the same. These here are Ricardo's, mine up to the left here. And underneath here, we have the two-piece seat, which actually goes in the car. I shall attempt in putting it together. The seat goes in the car. The reason it's in two pieces is because the car is so small, if it was in one piece, you wouldn't ever be able to get it out of the car. And what we look at as well is the condition of the tyre. You know, you look at the condition, you can see the melted rubber here, right, and you can see how sticky that is even now. Right, I mean, the tyre is cold, and you can pick that off, and you can see how sticky that is. These tyres across the corners can get up to 220 degrees and if you were to put your hand on when they were really, really hot, not only would it burn them, but you'd have a job pulling your hand away. I mean, they, they do give a lot of grip. So you look at the whole condition and you see the weight that we were talking about. This is the weight here and this is the weight that can fly off. Now, there's a, there's a bigger weight there and they actually put tape over there to secure them on, which is very, very important. But they check for everything. They check for all around the tyre, the tyre condition, whether there's any pinholes, 
or, or any what is known as spot blisters. Nigel ends the session with another few hundred autographs. Meanwhile, back at the pits, the local kids do a spot of policing the track, picking up the debris of the day. Team Williams labours hard. The race engine in. The car has been confirmed to specification. Tomorrow we'll see the moment of truth. Silverstone waits to be conquered. Day three, race day, Sunday, July 14th. Dawn, the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. The time, 5 a.m. The gates have opened, letting in a cascade over 150,000 strong into the newly improved circuit. Some have queued all night, others have slept in their cars. All are sleepy and not quite awake. They're patient and orderly, and once inside, very determined to find the best positions as quickly as possible, and to hold them. The Nijosi, or Mansell supporters, assemble. Who do they think will win the race? Mansell. <laughs> sure. Silly question. <laughs> Nigel Mansell. No doubt about it. Mansell. Nigel Mansell. Mansell. Mansell, of course. Mansell. Get her in the center. Good fantastic. Mansell's name is on everyone's lips. Almost. For some, sleep is the first priority of the day. A long doze in the morning summer sun. Then on to a breakfast fry up. Or strawberries and champagne. You don't get in here, no? <laughs> the flags are at the ready, the hats and boots are off. The banners and messages unfurl, the supporters form ranks. Terrible sight, Senna crossed back. The greatest day in British motorsport begins. But what of their hero? He's at the Frosties again and in cheerful form for the challenge that lies ahead. Good morning, everybody. Sunday morning, about 10 past eight now. We have warm up in uh, one hour and 20 minutes time. We're just uh, having a little bit of breakfast. This is the day of reckoning. Um, besides the warm up, straight into the race. The nice thing is, is that we, it looks like we have a fabulous day. I think you can hear the helicopter movements in the background and uh, I feel that uh, today's spectators will surpass uh, all previous Grand Prix. I think the gate has been up already something like about 30-40% and uh, I think today there will be something in the region of 150 to 200,000 people here which will be, uh, well, be just incredible. Chloe and Leo, my daughter Chloe, joining me for breakfast this morning and Leo. A little bit tired this morning, they had a late night last night, we went to the Cannon Barbecue, which uh, I think you'll see a little bit of. What can I tell you except uh, I hope that everything keeps going for me today, uh, reliability wise. I think the gearbox and the engine, the Renault engine and the team are working so well. We've had near enough a perfect weekend, so uh, I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. I should be going down shortly after I've had uh, my breakfast, straight down to see my race engineer, David Brown, and have a quick briefing of what we're going to do this morning. So I should probably catch up with you down there, and I'll be down there in probably about 10 minutes. Mansell heads for the paddock, which groans with treats for the enthusiast and high life for the well-heeled spectator. The chef in the blue chip section gets cracking. Helicopters descend in endless sorties to disgorge their VIP passengers into courtesy cars, which steer them to privileged seats. At a privileged price. For this sum, you have a fine lunch and coffee, too. Is this something of a bargain? There is no end of subscribers, and still they arrive. Away from the Formula One encampment is a kaleidoscope of motorsport, a supporting cast of thousands. Proud banners fly here too, 
Porsche, with their Carrera Cup contestants, a representation of seemingly all club races in Germany, with their flash coveralls and psychedelic sports cars, turned out in a spectrum of colours that shattered the eye, and with engines that pleased the ear. Teams from all over Europe abound. Up and coming drivers, all eager to be noticed by team managers at the top of their sport. Regard the growling Lamborghinis, favorite car of Saudi princes. The super sports racers with improbable engines, beautifully presented. Funny cars, always startling, all rub shoulders with fantastic examples of great marks like Maserati, and Ferrari. At Silverstone, they stand an excellent chance of doing what they were meant to. Silverstone Grand Prix weekend is truly a medieval tournament come to life. There are shops and stores, brilliant flags, and glorious costumes. Here are prancing steeds, the jousting knights, and brave champions. Helmets and armor, not forgetting the host of squires and proud heraldry of the warring factions. The place overflows with the rich and famous. The event has captured even royal interest of the highest in the land. There are princesses from far off lands, as well as those of rank and great degree. Strange sights, remarkable doings, and many wonders too. The cakes arrive, the ale flows. Every year we are here in Silverstone. Very good, very good. Dragons abound. The spirits arise. Magic fills the air. A display of marvels of another sort. And the best is yet to come. Derek Warwick gives us his views on Nigel Mansell. What can you say against Mansell? You know, I mean, he's, uh, he's tough, he's strong. Uh, he's very aggressive, he's controlled aggression. Uh, he's been unlucky not to be world champion, um, but I suppose to a certain extent he's made his own luck, really. Um, I think that um, as a Grand Prix driver, his uh, ability is undoubtable. I mean, he's, he's in the top three in the world, or he has been for the last three or four years. He's one of the hardest. You know, uh, Nigel gives nothing and takes a lot. Um, He's fair, you know, if you go in neck and neck and it's your line, he'll give it to you, but he ex he'll expect the same from, uh, uh, from you. And, um, but when, when he's out there, you've seen with some of the passing moves that he's had in the, in the past with uh, um, Senna in Budapest and PK here in 87, you know, they will go down in history as all-time great moves. You know, he's, he's very aggressive when he's in the car. But where is the British champion? who has the heart of a lion and the strength of ten. Nigel Mansell is doing a marathon of his team's sponsors. His pace is truly marvellous. Like some warrior prince, he rallies the faithful at every turn. Endlessly good-humoured, full of fun, always entertaining, and occasionally very witty. What beer under there, Nigel? <laughs> <laughs> Even though now and then he manages to wear the wrong hat. Where's the bat? One here it is. <laughs> Nigel takes us round the course. Uh, so straight away through here, you've got to come out in third gear, fourth, fifth, and sixth gear. And at this point, the start and finish line, you're about 150 to 160 miles an hour. Coming into Cubs Corner at 190 in sixth gear. 
change down to fifth, and then you just go flat and hang on, and just hope that you don't hit the wall out here. And you exit out here at about 160 miles per hour. Up through here, maggots, you enter actually in this corner, you see this is a bit of a corner, you actually enter into there, yesterday I entered in sixth gear which is probably about 190 miles an hour. The reason for that is my foot slipped off the pedal and went to the brake. So, uh, everybody says it was a great lap, it wasn't really. <laughs> now you know why I had to go to the bathroom. So anyway, I managed to get through there, then down to fifth, through there, and in less than one second you snap from one side to another, nine lateral G and then your eyeballs do this because they can't really see where they're going and that is true because then you have a problem focusing on this corner which makes us flip it down to fourth gear and we go around this last corner at about 130 to 140 miles an hour accelerating out of here into fifth immediate lane you get sixth about here and then you're probably approaching upwards of 200 miles an hour at this point here you just have in the brakes down to fifth through the first half of the corner, the second half times up, down to fourth, and then through here into Bale, and this is probably the hardest braking point, there's two, this is one of them, here down to second, through here, third, fourth, and fifth, even before you get out the corner. So you're starting from about 50 miles an hour here, and by this point here, which as you can see is still in the corner, you're probably doing 150 miles an hour. So that's where you can see the acceleration of a Formula 1 car is just fascinating. Also, the lateral G load this way, by the time you come out of the corner, you're pulling 4.5 lateral G. Accelerating up here, changing to 6th, and then through Abbey Curve, flat out, and then this is where I made up a little bit of time yesterday. You see this big corner here? What gear do you think I went in it? Sixth gear, flat out. The sixth gear, flat out. I took this corner yesterday at probably 190 miles an hour, and it wasn't comfortable. It was delightful once I came out of it, but when I was going in there, I was saying prayers. And then through here, I was in sixth, and then I had to go sixth, fifth, fourth, third, all in a space of about one and a half seconds. What you've got to realise, a Formula 1 car can accelerate from a standing start up to 200 miles an hour and stop again in less than 14 seconds. So, they're quite quick. <laughs> You've got a little bit laugh. <laughs> Sir, put your hands on the table. So, anyway, come in. Come in to... It's not your wife. Okay, fine. Um, so, concentrate, will you? Round Priory, third gear. <coughs> Gone red now. I have. <laughs> third gear, hanging on, sliding a lot. Round Buckland's in third again. Down here, squirt again. Third gear, through here again, in third. Hanging on, not waving to the crowd, smiling at them. And if you can do that, it just so happens you get round in one minute. 20.9 seconds, which just coincidentally happens to be pole position. <laughs> Outside, on the run again. As you can see, I don't know how much you've covered of this, but I've just done uh, two sponsors, Thanks, Canon and Labatt's. Uh, I've got a Labatt's hat on now. I keep getting confused which one to wear at times. But uh, I don't know what the time is, but we're still working away, and the pit lane opens at uh, 1 o'clock. Yeah. Pit lane opens at 1 o'clock. I've got to go back now and have a quick debrief with my engineer. And uh, I mean, basically, I've got to eat some pasta yet. I've got to have some food. I've got to have uh, some some liquid, I've got to prehydrate myself. I've still got to get back to the pits. Uh, with any luck, I might get my head down for 30 minutes, which is very important. But it's just to show you how hectic the British Grand Prix is and how special it is. So hopefully you'll catch up with me when I'm back in my village for about 20 or 30 minutes. So I'll see you up there then, because I've got to go and rush. Nigel shoots away again. A well-deserved siesta.
This unit is designed for reliability rather than total performance. Torqued down, polished, measured, remeasured, and measured again. The vehicle pulses with ruthless effort. Nothing less will make a winner. How does Nigel feel as the minutes tick away and the tension builds? It's uh, 18 minutes past one. We've got uh, 12 minutes before the pit lane opens and starts with the dummy grid. Uh, who butterflies, if the truth is known, all the expectation of the weekend now uh, you know, is in the next couple of hours. I can only say to you that we've uh, done the best homework we possibly can have done. It's now uh, basically all in the car here. Uh, what will be will be. Uh, the driver has to have a little bit of a philosophy like that because we can't control anymore. We've done everything we possibly can. And now in the next five minutes I'll be climbing in. Uh, I'd just like to show you the one last bit of uh, things that I do. This is a fireproof uh, barraclava that we'll be putting on in a minute. We have a tear off here which is similar to what the motorbike riders use. So when this gets dirty we can tear it off and we have a clean visor still underneath. And then we have fireproof gloves. And there's something that no one's ever seen publicly but I'll show you for the first time. This is an orthopedic collar which has done every race since 1977-78 when I broke my neck. That's done every Grand Prix I've ever done and every race I've ever done. And it's there in case I have whiplash or anything because we're in a bit of protection. The uh, water bottle feed so we can have a drink during the race, although I doubt whether there's going to be much time for that. And now uh, we'll probably see you on the grid because uh, I'm just about to get ready to get in the car. So I'll hopefully see you after the race, preferably with a good result. It's a rare occasion in life when a man takes full charge of his own destiny. This is such a time. is supercharged with expectation and high performance, a feast of speed and skill, a tribute to courage and finesse. The warm-up lab is completed. Mansell moves into his pole position. Now, watch the lights then. 59 laps of the British Grand Prix are about to begin. That's it! Two spinners, even before the competitors have done half a lap. And you can see already that Ayrton Senna and Nigel Mansell are pulling away from one of the Benettons. Yes, and the start has certainly held the red, the cars of the red a long time. As Mansell makes a dive inside Senna and he's taking the lead. So Mansell in the lead already. Mansell would dominate the British Grand Prix, pulling further ahead on every lap. Behind him, the race seethed with incident. There'd be various comings together. Andre de Cesaris added to his impressive list of crashes. And the Jordan team tried out the strength of their chassis. And the reaction times of the opposition. Mansell sails serenely on. There can be no doubt that the pace and heat of the day will demand a tyre change. The Williams FW14 has set a blistering pace, but a hard-won cushion of 20 seconds can be lost by staying out too long on warm rubber. Mansell comes in in textbook style. The ground shakes with the efforts of his devoted crew. 
minutes away, back into the lead with a loss of only 8.37 seconds. A splendid effort. Patrick Head's verdict, sound work. Final laps now. The Williams pit is strangely subdued. Is it the strain of waiting or the fear of a repeat of the catastrophe in Canada? Retirement only yards from the finish. Something is not right. Gearbox trouble. Nigel is on his own now. His team can offer no assistance. The last laps are agony to him. The fans sense victory. The team, their car, their hero. Nigel Mansell wins the British Grand Prix for the third time in his career. You don't need me to tell you how happy he is. And the world goes mad. Well, Nigel, this is his hour of triumph. Ayrton Senna, out of fuel and out of transport, was given a lift back to the pits by Nigel. It wasn't Ayrton's day. But there can be no doubt that the Brazilian gave his very best. And he remains Nigel's greatest rival. The race is run. Silverstone surrenders. To the winner comes a just reward. <laughs> A British driver, a British team, a majestic victory on home ground before a rapturous audience. It was an occasion of national pride. Even the Prime Minister of Great Britain would join in congratulations. The atmosphere is one of pleasure and delight, a joyful occasion in which everyone who witnessed the spectacle seems to be the victim. after the British champion departs. The cheering goes on and on and on. Well, we've just come into the, the truck now, just to sort of have a reprieve and catch one's breath. Chloe and Leo, Leo are here. What can I say except... Uh, it hasn't really sunk in yet. I mean, I'm just over the moon. I probably don't look over the moon because I'm hurting and I'm tired and I had quite a few problems and heart attacks on the last 10 laps because I had gearbox problem. But I mean, this time the problems were there and I managed to finish and I won the race, so thank the good Lord. Roseanne Mansell returns to the motorhome wreathed in smiles, ready for some refreshment. I need a drink. And home comes the conquering hero, exhausted by his win, deafened by his screaming engine, embraced, idolised and generally manhandled by the adoring public. Well, we're back in our encampment now and uh, we're going to be taking it easy and uh, maybe I can invite you and join us for a drink a little bit, bit later on. And and then I'll take a shower and have a cup of tea, as all good Englishmen do. And at this moment in time, just uh, 
take in the atmosphere and the scenery and I'll be back with you a bit later on. Minutes later and down to earth another Nigel emerges to recharge himself among contented friends and family. All join in together to share the summer's evening. A perfect ending to a perfect day. The weekend of a lifetime. Hi everybody again, it's 20 to 8 in the evening, uh, the sun is shining, it's sunk in that I've just won the British Grand Prix 1991, um, very happy, very tired, um, we're just having a barbecue outside, you can probably hear a little bit of chatter with some friends and family, unbelievable weekend wasn't it, and I truly hope that you have uh, a real good insight as to what one has to go through at uh, a normal Grand Prix. British Grand Prix perhaps isn't normal, uh, but it's certainly very, very intriguing, and um, I feel sure there'll be a lot of the program you'll enjoy, if not all of it. I can't really believe, especially with making this program, that uh, we've managed to pull it off. Um, very, very difficult if you're superstitious to make a kind of program like this and then have such a fantastic result. And for it to be witnessed and on film is, uh, is something else, isn't it? I really, truly hope that all of you have enjoyed watching this as much as I've enjoyed making it. And I want to dedicate my 18th Grand Prix win to you out there, the fans of Grand Prix and myself. Thank you very much.